Greetings to our viewing audience, and welcome to another global conversation in our series. I am Glenda Gay, and I have the distinct pleasure of moderating this engaging conversation with Emily Dick Ford, PhD, FCPA, FCMA. Emily is the Deputy Principal of the University of the West Indies Global Campus. She has worked with VUE for over 30 years, first as a lecturer in accounting at the UE's Cave Hill Campus in Barbados for 17 years and 13 years with the Open Campus. Emily served as a government senator and a minister of planning, housing, and the environment in the government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago from 2007 to 2010. Emily has a PhD in accounting that focused on corporate, social, and environmental reporting from the University of Dundee, Scotland in 2001. She is a certified professional accountant with CPA Canada with fellowship status. She earned a P an MPhil in finance from the University of Cambridge, England and a BSc accounting first class honors from the University of the West Indies, Cave Hill, Barbados. Emily is a scholarship winner with the Cambridge Commonwealth Trust, the Association of Commonwealth Universities, and the University of Dundee International Students Scholarship. Her publications and research work focus on, inter alia, critical accounting research, CSR slash ESG, ISO 26000, and strategic financial management. She is a member of the Voluntary Stakeholders Global Network for ISO 26000 and was recently invited by the Trinidad and Tobago Bureau of Standards to participate in Trinidad and Tobago's National Mirror Committee in the area of governance of organizations. Emily has a passion to advance responsible leadership and good governance in institutions, especially in the finance sector and among accounting and finance professionals towards a circular economy and a just and fair society. An advocate of lifelong learning, Emily has earned three certificates from the UN System Staff College programs with the latest in July 2023 for the intense one week synchronous course titled Governance for Sustainable Development. She recently delivered training on sustainable ocean financing and served on a panel for the Trinidad and Tobago Bureau of Standards webinar for the topic, the S, that's the letter S, in ESG focusing on ISO 26000. Our conversation today centers around locating the Caribbean effort in a UN Agenda 2030 world. Of course, we encourage you to type your questions or comments in the chat during the next hour or so as we have our conversation. Emily, Welcome. Thank you very much, Glenda. And I hope you all are seeing me. So yes, we are. Thank you very much, Glenda. Thank you so much. And I want to commence by saying a very pleasant good evening to everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us. And I want to say a warm greeting, warm greetings to those who will watch the recording after, because this is a conversation that, that needs to be ongoing. Your voice matters in this conversation, both those of you who are here live with us, 
and all voices matter. So even after this is being recorded, we look forward to getting your comments and questions sent to us. I want to thank the organizers of this, this series of conversations for the naming of these engagements as conversations, global conversations. And I want also to um, applaud them for using the notion of a global conversation and for accepting my request to be on the agenda for this UWI's 75th anniversary activity from the UWI Global Campus. The notion of conversations have been explored in a really empowering manner by Theodore Zelding in his 1998 book titled Conversations. An insight from his book states, and I quote, conversation doesn't just reshuffle the cards, it creates new cards. It is my hope that some things that we discuss this evening resonates with many of us. And I'll get back to that a little later. And feel free, as, as Glenda has said, to put your comments and questions in the chat so that we can have a dialogue as opposed to just me talking. And I'm only using slides to help you navigate around this topic, this very important topic. So my topic is simply locating the Caribbean effort in a UN Agenda 2030 world. And the topic is a truly global agenda that requires focused, clearly thought through and implemented efforts at the regional, local and individual levels for committed efforts for its achievement. So in our short time together, so in our short time together, I wanna just have the, the way the conversation will flow is in a manner to help to engage persons in the discussion. So we're gonna look at agenda 2030 and the 17 SDGs. These are very important. And some may have heard or some may not have heard. And if you have heard of the UN Sustainable Development Goals and you understand or you've heard about agenda 2030, just type in the chat, yes, I've heard or no, you haven't heard. We're also going to make take a brief minute to look at the link between the Paris Agreement and the Agenda 2030. Once we've done that, we're going to look at the recent assessment halfway to 2030. And, and again, this is the other thing. Have you heard any information? Have you seen or heard any information about the halfway, halfway assessment? We are halfway to 2030. Have you heard about the assessment? And then we're going to spend a little time locating the Caribbean. It actually is going to be a little research and homework for you to locate the Caribbean in this UN Agenda 2030. I'm going to then spend a little time on one solution to increasing Caribbean action for the goals. And it would have been kind of hinted in when Glenda was reading my bio. And then we'll have concluding comments, but we are really encouraging comments all the way through, please. So the 2030 agenda, one of the things that's really important is that we understand the, what exactly is this? And we have found in the past that a lot of people have never either have not heard or they've not taken the time to go and find out and I will tell you, one of the, one of the, the issues or, or hot topics across the world since 2015 has been the 2030 agenda. When I wanted to learn about it in 2015, when it was launched, I found all of the information I needed online. I had to do a presentation in 2016. I found information uh, and I did my research, I did my reading and, and analysis. And, and I want to encourage us that this is not some specialist little kind of white ivory tower topic. It is a topic that affects all of us and we are going to see that. So this little blurb here talk, that talks about the 2030 agenda for sustainable development, which is what it is. I, I captured it from the United Nations System Staff College. That's where I've done at least yeah, three of the many um, continuing education certificates that I've 
I've done on the sustainable development goals. I've done it with the UN system staff college. You may wish to have a, a look at that. And what they have said here is that by endorsing, by endorsing the 2030 agenda for sustainable development and its 17 sustainable development goals in 2015, the world community reaffirmed its commitment to sustainable development. Through this, this agenda, 193 member states pledged to ensure sustained and inclusive economic growth, social inclusion, and environmental protection, fostering peaceful, just, and inclusive society through a new global partnership. And I have the link there, and we can share that with you. One of the things that is really important to note about Agenda 2030 is that this is not something that came out of the clear blue sky in 2015. There is a long timeline, and, and I've, I've put it up on the slide. I've put it up on slides for you to have a look, but note that the, this did not start, as I said, in 2015 when the countries made their agreement. So let me go straight to that. So hopefully we'll have, a, have had a quick read of this, that the agenda is a culmination of more than four decades of multilateral dialogue and debate. And I would say that some of the principles and values are as old as human society. The principles and values that are part of this agenda are as old as human society. One of the terms that my mom always uses, there's nothing new under the sun. And so I want us to keep that in mind. So in 1948, there was the International Union for the Protection of Nature. Then 1949, UN Scientific Conference, 1954, that's where some of the themes for that are, that are used on, under the umbrella of sustainable development, those themes came through in a, in a publication by Harrison Brown. 1956, the first person dies because of mercury released in a particular bath and then thousands were poisoned. Now, let's stop at that point there and say this. The first person dies on record. So it, it's not that it is the absolute first time, but it's the first time it is recorded because years before there is now, there is a, a concern and an interest in what happens when we do these things. One, what happens when we release the waste from these industries into effluence? So somebody must have been checking um, in order to know this. So what do we, the reason, therefore, that when we look at a timeline like this, we are not looking at the timeline to say, oh, imagine that the first person. No, 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 not the first time at all. It really is at the first time on record. Yeah. And even now, across the world, in some countries where there are no scientific, there's no scientific research, no one is following up, no one is checking what's happening to the villagers in some remote parts where there are extractive industries nearby, nobody knows what is happening to their health and well-being. So we go forward. Then in, in 1958, the UN Conference on the Law of the Sea is held and it approves draft conventions on environmental protection. And this is very, very important because now we are beginning to get a framework, we are beginning to get some legislation, we're beginning to get some control around how institutions, corporations, how they go about doing business. Um, I want to say here too before, and I'm going to change the slide, but I'm going to say here as well that one of the item, one of the big issues that I found when I went to do my doctorate in the 1990s in Scotland was that there was that notion we had to actually my my supervisor and the whole team of researchers. We had to do a lot of work around seeking to get it out there that the, 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 the environment, the natural environment, the waterways, the, the land and so on is not an inexhaustible resource. And that is one of the mentalities that people held and probably still hold that you can put up any amount of waste out there, the sea will wash it away. You know, long ago we had that notion the sea will wash it away or, or the, when the rain falls, I will wash off. But there will always consequences. And our scientists have served us well to help us 
us to understand these things don't just wash away. They are there and they're going to impact um, human life. But then came the other understanding, and that's what all of these different UN things, and I didn't put all there. I cut out some because it was really too much, too many of them. But what has come to mind, what has come to the fore from the scientific, from scientific investigations, from people actually hearing the voices of people in remote areas, is that there were, there were always consequences to the way we use the environment as a kind of a waste, dispo waste disposal place. And also there were, were always impacts on our, on our health and well-being, but also the bigger impact on the actual atmosphere. And so we see the other, um, other dates appear, 1958, the United Nations Conference on the Law of the Sea, the World Wildlife Fund for Nature was established, the UN Conference on Human Environment and Prosperity, 1972, 1961, World Wildlife Fund, I keep seeing that again, and then 1979, the Convention on Long Range Transboundary Air Pollution is adopted, which means we have now come, we have now come into that understanding that pollution in one place was actually affecting the air quality in other parts of the world, not just in that one place. And, and of course, this is all part of the um, um, met the meteorological research and science and so on. And, and I don't know how many of you know the Bible, you know, the Bible says in the last days, knowledge will increase. And we are in a time when there's increasing knowledge, not just because of technology that, that um, brings us live into different things, but also because of the research that is being generated, new knowledge is coming forward all the time. And with new knowledge, we are required to do better. What Maya Angela said, when you know better, you do better. And so we also have the UN con the, um, convention, as I said, that one, the World Climate Conference, concluded then that the greenhouse effect from increased buildup of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere demands urgent international action. Now. There are some people who still deny that there is any greenhouse effect and all of that. But we have to understand that science is in fact something that you can back up, you can verify. 1992, when I would have skipped some years, the Business Council, and this was important for us in the Caribbean, the Business Council for Sustainable Development publishes change in course. It establishes business interests in promoting sustainable development practices. Now, the business agenda would have been set back then, 1992, and formally. But I have a book. Let me see if I can just reach it. When you're conversing, you can reach for things, right? I have a book. <laughs> I have a book titled Values, Prosperity, and the Talmud, Business Lessons from the Ancient Rabbis. And this talks about the social and environmental respons environmentally responsible um, practices of Jewish, Jewish businesses based on their Talmud, which is their sacred writings. So they had business practices way back from centuries. And we know that, that the Jewish writings are from two decades, two centuries, two millennia, or even long, or even further back. And in their business practices would be, um, well, those who, have, who are following that the Talmud practices, social and environmentally responsible actions that we are now, that are now embedded in Agenda 2030. So the business was, business um, said, you know, reflected and said that they were interested in promoting sustainable development practices. Can we say that this is what we are seeing in the Caribbean? Are our businesses truly practicing sustainable development? Are truly sustainable in the way they are practicing business? So we'll talk about that a little later. So again, the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development is held in Rio de Janeiro. And this is a big one that we most of us um, remember as well. Apart from when the sustainable development definition was coined, we also had this big one in Rio again. Agreements are reached on Agenda 21, the Convention on Biological Diversity, Framework Convention on Climate Change, that's the big one. 
and non-binding forest principles. Then 1994, and the reason I, I would have slipped in here, they did not, in the timeline that I found, did not have the second bullet point, but you'll see why we need that second bullet point. So in 1994, the first global conference of sustainable development of small islands, uh, that was mandated, and that conference was mandated by the UN as General Assembly, held in Barbados, and it spoke to the need for an island-specific conference, and that was highlighted in 1992. Now, it was from this conference that I found out about this whole social and environmental accounting, and then by 1995, I went and I did my PhD, because from that conference, one of my lecturer colleagues, who was also a former lecturer of mine, Dr. Robertine Chaderton, she went to the small island development states village in Barbados. I was, I did not go. The conference was in Barbados. I did not go, I confess. But Dr. Chaderton went and she knew. And this is the whole thing about conversations. She knew that I said that after I'd finished my master's in finance, I did not want to do anything that was not purposeful. When I'm going to do my PhD, it had to be purposeful. And she came back from that conference with a little pamphlet and dropped it on my desk in my office and said, this is what you're looking for, Emily. And that booklet said, social and environmental accounting. And we did the research, she helped me, and I found my supervisor, who was the top researcher, in, who was out of the UK. And everybody said to me, if you're going to do a PhD in this area, do it with Rob Gray. And so I want to thank Robertine for listening. And in fact, we were conversing. And that's the importance of conversations things change when you converse. And I'm seeing a lot of chats, a lot of comments in the chats, um, Glenda. So I don't know if you yes. want to, to share well, anything that you're seeing there. Well, many people are greeting, greeting you said, um, okay. as they're joining. <laughs> but it is interesting that as you were talking, what came to me, I was reminiscing about SIDS. They were yes. just talk of since we were at school at the time it was just on the periphery of our understanding for those who didn't do social sciences uh, we just knew about this big conference and everybody had to do all these things but yes you, you're bringing back lots of memories so I hope it's the same for others in in the conversation <laughs> yes and then you're dating me then when you talk about <laughs> going to school and I'm lecturing at Cave Hill so anyway <laughs> so that was, was really, really an important time. And, and it, indeed, Barbados engaged the entire society in that Small Island Development States Conference. And one of the key points that came out, uh, I want to read this study, that Small Island Development States are a special case, both for environment and development, and are considered extremely vulnerable to global warming and sea level rise. And that was in 1994. And we have seen more and more how true that is and how much we need to be really focused as a region to do just what Prime Minister Motley is doing, to yes. join in that and to go forward as well as yes. a region to be doing more. And just before you continue to the next slide, there's a comment that says, I agree with you, uh, DP, concerning the age of this conversation and awareness Yep. As an unqualified assistant teacher between 1985 and 1988, wow. and this person was a teenager, Yes, I taught social studies from fifth to fifth form, and one of the topics at the CXC CSEC level was natural resources and the matter of exhaustible and inexhaustible natural resources. That's right. So from yep. way back when the conversations had started. Started, yep. Yes. Because the research was there. And I like that concept, that that I that it was um, exhaustible and inexhaustible. Yes. And that's when we, we had to admit that the environment, the physical environment, the seas, the air, the atmosphere mm -hmm. around us, was not inexhaustible in terms of what it can absor absorb. So that's excellent comment there. Thank you for that. And I, I will not, as I said, I, I didn't plan to go through all of the, these timelines, but it, so many stories in here. And then 2002, I wanna say this because of where I want to land when I, when I come conclude the conversation, the Global Reporting Initiative 2002. The Global Reporting Initiative formulates guidelines on reporting on the economic, environmental, and social dimensions 
of business activities. I want to say here that I did my PhD, as I said, 1995 is when I went to University of Dundee. Um, I noticed that you froze for a moment. I was just confirming that it wasn't on my side. I am hearing you. I am hearing you. I didn't just freeze. I didn't just freeze. I actually fell out. Oh. Into, but hopefully we are back on again. Yes, we are. Thank you. Yeah, so I was saying that the Global Reporting Environment put this thing out in 2002 for businesses to report. But before that, all over the world, people were reporting voluntarily. But when I did my research, I had to research absence. I had to research absence because there was nothing of significant, nothing that was statistically significant being reported from the Caribbean on social and environmental, um, the social and environmental impacts, the economic, social, and environmental dimensions of business activities in the Caribbean. But we won't cry over that because a lot has happened since then. So then having given that timeline, what we have, have gotten a sense of, and, and I see the, people, the audience has, in fact, people in our, people who are with us here in this conversation can in fact attest to that slowly but surely you had information coming in and this is nothing new. One of the, most important aspects of Agenda 2030 is that it is not only about the sustainable development goals. And when you go and look online, if you go now, you pull up the Agenda 2030, any publication from the UN and others, because there are lots of publications, good quality. They're going, you're going to get a clear sense that Agenda 2030 is not only about the sustainable development goals. The sustainable development goals are some clear markers that will tell us that we are close to or, or have achieved or are getting to be um, a, a globe that is, being that is developing sustainably. What has to be taken on board and in, integrated into the way we think, how we do everything, would be the core principles that under, underpin the agenda. So I want to share the core principles with you. They are before you, universality, leaving no one behind, interconnectedness and indivisibility, inclusiveness and multi-stakeholder partnerships. And so let me, allow me to read through what these are. And I can't, I can't ad lib it because it's so, they are so important, but the principles are critical to, the, uh, to us understanding what needs to be done, how to do it, and the kind of sustained and consistent effort that's needed. So universality says that the 2030 agenda is universal in scope and commits all countries, irrespective of income levels and development status, to contribute towards a comprehensive effort for sustainable development. The agenda is applicable in all countries, in all contexts, and at all times. And one of the reasons for this universality principle that is and why, why and why it is so important is that before we had the sustainable development goals and the and agenda 2030 we had the millennium development goals and those development goals were only for developing countries they were not for everybody and i guess the the lesson that was learned then was that you cannot try to develop the underdeveloped countries on their own this has to be a a total, it has to be a universal effort. And that universality says 
you cannot achieve sustainable development in, a, in one country. It has to be a global effort. And, and if you remember the timeline spoke to the understanding that there were transboundary um, impacts from pollution activity in one place. And in fact, Chernobyl is a great example of that. What happened when um, that nuclear facility got in trouble and where did the emissions and those harmful emissions go? So we need we understand universality as you cannot do this as a one country or one region thing. It is a global effort. Then leaving no one behind, which is the, the it is the, the principle that I hold really closely, but I really need to hold on to all, <laughs> leaving no one behind. The 2030 agenda seeks to benefit all people and commits to leave no one behind by reaching out to all people in need and deprivation wherever they are in a manner that targets their specific challenges and vulnerabilities. This generates an unprecedented demand for local and disaggregated data to analyze outcomes and track progress. The only way you can know what I need is if you're close enough to me. So there must be that local um, focused, even case study kind of uh, family by family, by individual um, attention in order to leave no one behind. So again, while it is universal, it, it also cannot just stay universal. It has to be local, it has to be personal. Then interconnectedness and indivisibility, the 2030 agenda rests on the interconnected and indivisible nature of its 17 sustainable development goals. So you can't go and cherry pick. So it is crucial that all entities responsible for the implementation of, of the SDGs treat them in their entirety instead of approaching them as a menu list of individual goals from which they, they pick and choose. We cannot say, well, we are only dealing with climate action, which a lot of people tend to have that mentality. We're only dealing with climate action. You must deal with climate action within the context of social development. While you are, while we are focusing on net zero, we cannot hinder persons from developing their need for to, to exploit the energy, um, the energy resources that they have to help build up the the, the um to help improve development and advance development in their nation. The issue is how we do that um, development of oil and gas, for example. How do we do that? And we will get to that, but I will still drop the word. It's called responsibly. The word is responsibly. Everything, if done responsibly, can certainly be done. There should be, there is no need to be, to exclude anything. And then the next principle is inclusiveness. The 2030 agenda calls for the particip participation of all segments of society, irrespective of race, gender, ethnicity, and identity to contribute to the implementation of the 2030 agenda goals. And then multi-stakeholder partnerships, the agenda calls for establishing multi-stakeholder partnerships for mobilizing and sharing knowledge, expertise, technology, and financial resources to support the achievement of the sustainable development goals in all countries. And so one partnership that I can speak to is that the University of the West Indies has a very good and thriving and hopefully increasing partnership with the Open Society Foundation, Open Society Foundations. And we, my office working with Andre Burnett, who I know is here, we got funding to establish a climate literacy hub, which also deals with issues of climate justice. And its main purpose is to do just what this multi-stakeholder partnership is for. It is to share knowledge and for, for, to mobilize and share knowledge and expertise, technology and technology in our region, but it is open to anyone in the globe. And so you can you will hear more about that event soon and we will be able to share a link because the website, the hub is about to be established um, to be to go live. It's being developed as we speak. Now, 
just to share before you continue that there's a lot of support for, for your comments in the chat. And one person says, and so the huge challenge is to reconcile all the different imperatives so we get sustainable human and environmental development so that we can achieve growth that's sustainable. Um, yes, the, the chats are thought provoking. Yes, very good. Thank you for that comment. Whoever placed it there, yes. very important. And then we go through, and I want you to bear with me. The reason I'm going through the dimen these different aspects of Agenda 2030 is because we need this recording to be able to share wider because a lot of people are not aware. There are a lot of people who are aware, but strangely, a lot of us who are aware, and I am alert, alert to it now because I've engaged people and I realize people didn't know. A lot of people who are aware and working in it assume that other people know, but they don't. And when we get to the assessment, we'll understand partly why the assessment is what it is. And so in terms of the dimensions of Agenda 2030, they are called the five Ps. People, prosperity, planet, partnership, and peace. And, and I'll tell you, eh, when I started my PhD, the focus really was on people and planet. And there was not a concept because at that time, and, and, I, and I, I, I don't know how, to, I want to say this in a diplomatic way. At that time, some of the persons who were teaching us and introducing us to the topic were a bit fanatical. So they would say things like, we should just kill out all the humans and let the flora and fauna thrive. Now, the Bible says that God gave man dominion. So my focus is that we have to now be responsible in how we exercise dominion in the earth. And also some of the people who, I don't want to say taught me, I don't want to pinpoint anybody. Some of the people that I read back in the day, they had no concept or nor did they want to accept that business should make money off of what they do. And, and so the, the 2030 agenda really got a handle on, we can have all of it. We can have all of it if it's done responsibly. And so these are the dimensions of this 2030 agenda. They are, they are the five critical dimensions, people, prosperity, planet, partnership, and peace. And these are traditionally viewed through the lens of three core elements, the social inclusion, economic growth, and environmental protection. So when I did my PhD, it was social and environmental accounting. And the focus was on the social impact, the environmental impact, and economic impact. And the concept of sustainable development has taken on a richer meaning as a result of getting these dimensions into the conversation. And it builds upon this traditional approach by adding two critical components. So usually it was, um, as I said, it was people, I think prosperity and planet. And now what we have is partnership and peace. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you how important, well, well, I shouldn't have to say how important peace is because we are seeing what yeah. is happening. We, we are seeing what has happened when, they, they, when we have war. And in the past, remember, we have seen our brothers and, and sisters in the Sudan suffering for decades from war. They cannot catch themselves to develop. Ethiopia, different places. But now we're seeing even more. Um, the, the war in Ukraine, then the war now that just broke out in um, the Middle East, Peace has a major part to play in the achievement of the of Agenda 2030. And I think we can all resonate with that. We can all, um, you know, identify with that. So genuine sustainability sits at the core of these five dimensions. So, so it is not um, a straight line issue. It's a very complex issue. When I went to do my PhD, and, and, I, and I want to confess that I was the only student who took more than three years to do my PhD. But part of the reason is, apart from the fact that I was researching absence because nobody, no Caribbean companies were reporting meaningfully on their social and environmental impact. So apart from the fact that I have to research absence, 
I had to find a framework that would, or a philosophy or a social theory that would help me to make um, a, a proper contribution. And I actually landed on pragmatism, which is um, the American philosophical tradition of pragmatism. And I used the neo-pragmatist um, philosophy or social theory of Dr. Cornell West. And please put that in the chat and go look him up. He's actually running for president in the USA now. So Dr. Cornell West, I used him back in 1990s. Never used an accountant before. So I had to navigate philosophy and social theory, social psychology, and all sorts of things in order to come to a place where I could understand what is happening in the Caribbean. And, um, and that's another, um, another webinar that somebody needs to host for me to come and tell you all about that. But genuine sustainability sits at the core of these five dimensions. And I picked up for what my PhD, one of the things that came out of it is how, apart from the complexity of the issues that we're dealing with, is also the multiplicity of the solutions. The solutions are not just one thing or two things. They are very, very complex solutions, but solutions when broken into individuals, companies, regions, nations, global effort, they can happen, they can be achieved. So I'll try to go a little faster because I think I'm going to run out of time. So these are the 17 goals, the sustainable development goals that have been articulated to help us to get to sustainable development. And they are no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, and this is part of quality education here, and we in the global campus, we offer it, gender equality, clean water and sanitation. Let me go back to gender equality. When in 2016, I went to do a presentation on the sustainable development goals and social protection, I did that in Anguilla, where we have a site, our head of site at the time there, Dr. Phyllis Fleming's bank invited me. Actually, our current principal is who brokered that. He was the director um, of our country sites at the time. When they invited me, I did my research. I had been, I always keep up with these kinds of issues, but I'd never made any connection between this and social protection. But long story short, in doing the research, one of the things when I read about gender equality, I realized that the focus tends to be on women and girls. And that's because, of course, across the world, and especially in some parts of the world, women and girls are grossly mistreated. However, one of the things I said in that present, in that lecture that I did in Anguilla to the, to the it was a, a large audience in, in a very small island, was that in the Caribbean, we must also pay attention to the welfare of our males, our men and boys. And I'm the mother of a son. And I can tell you, it is very important. In fact, in the U U UWI, we are seeing that our numbers of the percentage of females far outstrip the percentage of males in programs in university. And so as we go through these, do not, and as you read it, I really encourage you to go look them up and as you click on each one, you're going to see a lot of things, and I'm going to show you a little bit. There are targets and indicators for each goal. And when you look at gender equality, ask yourself some questions. How does this apply to my region, to my nation, to my household? Yeah. And then so then we have clean water and sanitation at six, seven, affordable and clean energy, and um, decent work and economic growth industry innovation and infrastructure, reduced inequalities, sustainable cities and communities, responsible consumption and production. This is where we need serious personal transformations. We have to really reduce, and I, and I keep being, you know, challenging myself, and I have to be even more particular. We have to reduce our consumption. We overeat, we overbuy, we produce a lot of waste while other people in other places um, have little or nothing. Then climate action, which most people are aware of, life below water. This is a big thing. 
if you look at our region, the biggest part of our region would be the waters. And so ocean, ocean, the development of our ocean industries is a big frontier that is being explored by many of our islands now. Life on land, very important in terms of how we treat with flora, fauna, and human life. Then peace, justice, and strong institutions. And this speaks to both peace and a sense of responsibility in terms of how we lead. How do we, how do our governments lead? And not just governments at the national level, but local governments. How do we lead our institutions? How do we lead at home? And in, in, in within that is also this notion of peace as well. So I, when I first started looking at this, this was the one that was most um, that was most um, exciting to me to look at and read and be a part of. And then 17 partnerships for the goals, very, very central to everything that is done. And so <clears throat> I'm going to just explore SDG one only because we don't have time to do all. But I, again, I invite you to, you just Google it or you tell Siri what you want to look for. Siri, UN Development, Sustainable Development Goals or UN Agenda 2030 report for 2023. And just go through and look. So SDG one, which is end poverty in all its forms everywhere has seven targets, I believe it's seven. And the first one is to eradicate extreme poverty by 2030, and it outlines what that means. The second target is to reduce poverty by at least 50%. So remember, you have extreme poverty and you have poverty. And when we think of extreme poverty and we look at our region, what country comes to mind? If you can put that in the chat, and Glenda can tell me, because the chats are not coming up. All right, we're not seeing any as yet. Okay. Uh, what, Haiti, what Haiti, Haiti. Overarching Haiti. That's yeah. right. And could I tell you, I have always been of the view from the time these, the Agenda 2030 was published and all of the information came out, I was always of the view that we cannot say that we have achieved Agenda 2030 if Haiti is left behind. But now we have so many other countries across the world that has that has to now join that, um, including the Ukraine, which was really well going along really well. And that's how important the interconnectedness of the dimensions, the principles are. So Haiti is at the forefront. I know that CARICOM is doing a lot, but there's a lot more that we can do. I know yeah. that the, so go ahead. No, you, you, and the comments are saying that many governments find these other areas of the SDGs uncomfortable to speak about. Hmm. And so the, maybe it's a sense that they're avoiding it, but but you have to face it eventually. Um, whoever said that, if you want to tell me, tell me who said that, if that, because if that person could give us a little bit more dialogue on that, because let me tell you, when I come to the assessment, that person is absolutely correct. They're spot on. I, I take ownership of that <laughs> deputy principle. I, I have always felt that it seems to be an area because it is within our reach and mm -hmm. we can do deliberate intervention in it, we tend to avoid it. And then we speak glibly of climate um, matters oh. because we, we think we can blame it on, on others. That's that, my view. That is a powerful intervention there. We, I'm, we are using first names, so don't call me deputy principal. <laughs> Principal um, Francis, that is um, that's a very powerful and and that's something we need to discuss further and even write about because you're going to see what happens. So so there's extreme poverty, there is poverty, and so there are two measures, there are two sorry targets: eradicate extreme poverty, reduce poverty by at least fifty percent. So we don't want extreme poverty to exist anywhere in the world by 2030. Now, reduce poverty, this is, a very, this is a very solid biblical position because Jesus said the poor will always be with us. But the poor does not, they do not have to live in, in extreme poverty. There's a big difference, yeah? And then implement social protection systems, which as I said, we spoke about that when I went to Anguilla. 
equal rights to ownership, basic services, technology, and economic resources. This is an important one for our region, for our global campus. We have, this is one of the things as a remit for us to ensure that all men and women, in particular the poor and the vulnerable, have equal rights to economic resources, as well as to access basic services, ownership and control over land and other forms of property. And now notice all of these things really require SDG 4 to be fully deployed, which is quality education, which is education for sustainable development. People have to be educated and we who claim we are educated have to act like if we are. And, it, and that resonates as well with, that links up as well with what Francis just shared. And then you have 1.5, 1.6, and 1.7. So I encourage you to have a look at these. Now, one of the things, that same site that I took the, that those, that the information from says, ask the question, what can, what you can do? It says, what you can do? What, so what can all of us do? And one, and there are a number of things that they say, but I share just this one. Find a goal one charity. And if you cannot find a goal one charity, what should we do? We set up, we establish a goal one charity. And that's one of the things that I'm working on, setting up a charity that would help to advance the goals. So find a goal one charity that you can support. And that you can support means that you trust the people to spend your money and your resources on what, you, what they say they're going to do it for. And that's why the, the, the language around the SDGs is very precise, you know, very precise, very accurate language. So find a goal, one charity you want to support, well, want to support. Any donation, big or small, can make a difference. And my suggestion to us all is do the research, read all of the SDGs and their related targets. Work has also been done on indicators for effective recording reporting, monitoring, and evaluation of progress with the Sustainable Development Goals. And right in the University of the West Indies, our colleague, Dr. Nadini Prasad, she has a book out, and I have a copy of it. It's not near me. I have a copy of it. It's, it's, it's where I was working earlier. The book is titled, The Role of Monitoring and Evaluation in the UN 2030 SDGs Agenda. So Nadini did this in, in um, collaboration with a colleague from abroad. Now, one of the things I would like to say is that the, and I'm saying it now, just in case I run out of time and I don't get to, we at the Global Campus are rolling out continuing professional education and continuing professional development for professionals across the board, whatever profession you're in, banking, finance, um, education, and for me, especially professional accountants, rolling out training that can count for your CPDs, your continuing professional development units, the points that you have to do every year, that would give you a deep dive into Agenda 2030 and specifically on sustainability reporting, the new sustainable, sustainability standards that have been issued. There are two, there are also priorities that are being set. And in the Caribbean, we need to be more engaged as accountants, helping our corporations to take part and to take a big part, integral part in the achievement of the sustainable development goals. One of the things we know, I know for a fact is the governments in the region, for those countries that have actually been doing anything, they have done a lot in Barbados, in Trinidad and Tobago, but the government alone cannot just be laying down policies and putting down frameworks and building the capacity of the public officers. It has to be something that rolls out into the private sector in a, in a deep and meaningful way and into every household, yeah? So that there, there's a lot more that we can do. And I would like us to, um, Andrea, to, and I told Nadini this already, we need to work with Nadini to come up with a course that covers the work in her book, because this is a very valuable um, book for the world. 
and it's out of our region and we need to, um, to actually have training around this book, the role of monitoring and evaluation in the UN 2030 SDGs agenda. A really good book. <clears throat> and I'm going to go past a number of things because I believe we need to come to the assessment and then come to a close. So in terms of the assessment, the halfway assessment. So in 2015, the 20, 2030 agenda was set. Countries agreed and they, were, they signed off and everybody was gung-ho. And halfway to 2030, this is seven and a half years. I hope my math is right. This is what has been found, that we've only achieved 15%. And look at it again. So here it is, Francis. You said what you said about why we are not seeing progress on things like zero hunger. Goal one, which is zero hunger, 48% of that is moderately or severely off track. And then another, third, another percentage of it, I can't tell what the percentage is, is stagnation or regression. And the great part is insufficient data. So it's it's um, either not reported on, it has worsened, there is fair progress, but acceleration is needed. And only in, in terms of there's no green on goal one at all. And I was quite shocked about that. There's no green on goal one. And so we have these, um, we have the, these, uh, the assessment is here. Goal 16, that's peace, justice, and strong institutions. That's where you're going to speak about responsible leadership, responsible governance. Again, yellow, red, and gray, no green at all. And that's where we talk about peace. And so we are very concerned. In fact, goal 13, I'm quite surprised to see no green. The amount of climate action and climate talks that we've had. So I'm gonna keep going forward. And Glenda has a link, um, a, a, a website to show you, to share with you in the, in the chat. Um, if you can grab that, I'm not sure if you'll be able to have time in here now to do deal with it. But if you grab that link, it gives you an interactive map, an interactive document, I should say, which includes a map that gives you each country across the world whether they have no information. So as far as I saw, St. Vincent and the Grenadines has no information. Antigua, which is very, very active in this space with sustainability and um, sustainable ocean, ocean de development of our ocean um, resources in a sustainable manner. They are very big with climate finance and so on. When I looked at Antigua, there was a lot of missing information as well. And there were some things that had not advanced. And the whole thing about missing information, there is an important role for the University of the West Indies, for higher education institutions, for education institutions across the levels from early childhood all the way up to um, continuing education. There is an important role for us to help to build up capacity in terms of knowledge and understanding so that when it comes to the reporting and recording and even the actions that that from which the recording will be done, that can be ramped up. We are far behind in terms of our understanding, our knowledge, our, our, our actions on the 2030 agenda. Um, you, look, you should go look at UN ECLAC as well and see what they're saying. One of the reasons I have this up is that I wanted to read just this part where it says, despite signs of progress in some areas, the confluence of crises, dominated by COVID-19, climate change, and conflicts are creating spin-off impacts on food and nutrition, health, education, the environment, as well as peace and security, as pointed out in the 2022 report. So it is, it is, it is a, a, a set of complex things and challenging things that are affecting us, but we as a people, God has given us the intelligence, the intellect, the ability, and the dominion to take charge of these things. And it really is about our personal focus. What are, or what is my priority? 
And so our priorities have to be, we have to take better care of ourselves and then better care, help to take better care of our neighbor as well. And, and so one of the things that came out in the UN ECLAC report when I was reading was that the that Latin America and the Caribbean and not just the UN report, Jeffrey Sachs, who is the, so this is the UN ECLAC um, thing. I'm not gonna go through this one. Jeffrey Sachs, Professor Jeffrey Sachs from the University of Columbia, which are, they are way out there in all their climate action and research. He also pinpoint Latin America and the Caribbean as having suffered the worst from COVID-19 and that our schools were closed longer. We had um, our businesses were closed longer. And so there was a lot of reversal in terms of SDG one, two, and so on, and four, and as well as health. So in terms of the overall picture, at high risk are uh, SDGs 1, 10, 11, 13, and 16. And in better, in better conditions to be achieved by 2030 would be SDGs 3, 7, 9, 12, 15, and 17. And so the assessment has shown that while some areas are, are improving, if you notice the ones that really impact the quality of life, the quality of human life, especially the quality of life of the most vulnerable, those are the ones that are at high risk. And I believe Francis is onto something and it's something we need to explore and write about it and even create dialogues in. So when we think about our continuing professional education that we're going to do in this area, it will not just be us saying, go and read this, go and read that but it really will be create space, to create spaces for conversation to be able to do what needs to be done. So I'm gonna go past this because this, this speaks about Jeffrey Sachs report and then solutions. And I've been talking a bit about the solutions in between because I realize it's getting late. So Glenda, I'm going to say that with respect to what, where the solutions lie, those of us who are in this space now and who will listen to this know for a fact that accountants, managers, um, people in the banking sector, all of those management and finance related um, professions, we are far behind in the Caribbean with respect to action and what can be done. And we are the open campus in the global campus we in the global campus are ready and capable and able to provide the training the, that is needed. And one of the things I would say, and Francis will back me up on this, we have a lot of material that we can provide on demand for free, on demand for a low fee. And then we have more, the more high-end certificates. You can get a certificate, you can get a master's degree. We are also the location, our global campus, the location for the International School for Development Justice that would be rolling out programs specifically related to the sustainable development goals. But beyond all of that is a plea, I would say a plea for all of us to take a personal responsibility, take up our personal responsibility as individuals, as members of a family, as citizens in a country, as part of a region and as global citizens to do whatever we can at every stage that we have an influence. Remember, leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. John Maxwell has told us that. And, and he always says that he got it from somebody else. So when we think of solutions to this complex crisis, think of yourself. I think of myself first, think of yourself first, and then think, okay, where do I have influence? All of the places, my church, my home, the schools nearby, the mall, you know? And so <clears throat> there is quite a lot more that we have to offer. And so my, that we have to say on this topic, but I will stop here because I believe it's an important space for us to, to come to a conclusion and to hear from the, from those who are listening in, and certainly Glenda will help to facilitate that. Um, and I'll leave this slide up and I can say, say something about this at the end. So Glenda, over to you, please. Thank you very much. Active chat that's ongoing. Um, I'll just share some of the comments. The state of Haiti supports your argument. 
the, um, that peace is significant for sustainable development. Mm -hmm. Then there's a question, but do you think that we are reaching a point where some major decisions have to be made and some types of exploitation of resources may have to be ruled out? For example, the world is groping towards such decisions with fossil fuels. So, you know, you can, of course, let me know if you want to respond to any of them. Yes, yes, that, but certainly yes. Um, major decisions apparently were taken at the most recent United Nations General Assembly. Apparently there were like strong statements and strong commitments made and Prime Minister Mia Motley, um, backed up by her CARICOM colleagues, they have been pushing for particular changes in international finance. Um, World Bank and, and International Monetary Fund. And the way funding has been um, allocated or, or the kinds of funding has, that has come to developing countries that has kept us in poverty. When, um, mm -hmm. help me here, Francis, um, how Europe underdeveloped Africa? Mm -hmm. that, uh, yes, our, by, by our- the order, um, Yes. So, yeah, so yeah, then he, but we have to go back in the, into history, Eric Williams and, um, and the guy who wrote that book, I don't know why he, his name escaped me now, and I have books by him all around me, I'll have to look around and find it. Anyway, when they wrote, they wrote about inequalities and injustices that have kept certain countries, certain regions, certain neighborhoods in poverty. You're speaking of Walter Rodney, of course. Walter Rodney, thank no. you very much. I don't know why it escaped. I need to put a, a notice up with all those names. But when you look at what Walter Rodney and um, Dr. Eric Williams, what they wrote, it really is for a time. We have to understand those guys were getting at the heart of what interferes with the development of, of, of nations. And so you are correct. And yes, there are, there are decisions to be made about how we exploit, um, how I shouldn't say exploit, how we use natural resources in our region. And that's another con a conversation for another time. Um, if Andre can put the link to a Just Transition massive open online course that we have created, it's free um, on Future Learn. You can go and I think Andre might correct me. Andre, you put in the chat what it is, right? If it really is free, or if you have to pay now, if you can do it free, but if you want a certificate, you have to pay. But there is a conversation around a just transition to, to a low carbon economy. Some people say it should be net zero, it should be zero carbon. But if you say that, it means you have to totally not be using oil and gas, and that is not um, acceptable at all, especially for countries who need to, act to use their oil and gas resources to develop. But the key is to do it responsibly. Yes. Um, so Glenda, yes, go ahead, please. Just wrapping up. Um... From what I've read of the 2030 SDGs, there seems to have been a greater focus on gender equality. And in some of the guidelines for many of the SDGs, racial equality has been sidelined. Please be so kind as to give your view, Emily. Yes, and, and very insightful comments. So can I tell you, what you see about the SDGs has everything to do about the authors and the agenda that some people have. And really and truly, it is important. That's what I said. Do your own research. Go to the UN site and look at all of the material on Agenda 2030. And that's why one of the important things to take away is that the Sustainable Development Goals are not Agenda 2030. Agenda 2030 is a bigger thing. And the goals are just there to help us get to that bigger thing, which is sustainable global sustainable development and you have to we have to keep our focus on the dimensions and the principles and those principles and dimensions tell us that you cannot just be focusing on gender equality and remember they a lot of the gender equality is about women is about women helping women to come up but i've made the point that we also have to look in our caribbean region at the plight of men and boys as well Yes. Now I know we've gone just 10 past the hour, but um, I'm going to beg your indulgence because I know we had a break earlier. So um, I'm going to grab back that, that, that those few moments just to wrap up here. Um, yeah. Some final comments. I'm glad that you brought up Haiti. Who's going to get France to repay Haiti so that it has a shot at sustainable development? 
I think when you listen to what Prime Minister Motley has been saying, we need that kind of voice, that kind of, of, of pressure to be put on the international community. And, and that's why slowly but surely you're going to see these changes because now people, we never, a lot of people never knew that Haiti had been paying France all of these decades while Haiti, the people in Haiti have been suffering. So yeah. now when you look at these principles, there can, there's no place in the world now for that. And so we can make demands. So it is really us. Eh? And whoever wrote that you have, it means what they said, if, if you, where, where the interest for, or where, where you see the problem, the solution is very well with you as well. So Pat, uh, with us. Yeah, go ahead, yes. Brenda. Of course, Agenda 2030 has been hit by double and triple whammies of economic crises, wars, pandemics, growing yeah. social conflict and instability in many countries, and the ever intensifying pressure of catastrophic climate, climatic events. That's right. So that's just a comment there. Seagull 16, for instance. Sorry, you, you can yes. respond. No, you go. All right. So there's a different, right. Let me yes. respond to that because what I have seen in terms of the report from, from Jeffrey Sachs, Professor Sachs from Columbia University, is they're saying that we have fixed goals for a world in flux. So what he's saying is that the world is in flux. Things have, a lot has changed since the goals were articulated. And so there is perhaps a need to go back to the goals and make some adjustments as well. But also because I don't think the goals actually, because this is really about risk, risk management and identifying what are the risks and the risk to Agenda 2030, just what your, the commentator um, listed. Mm -hmm. So go ahead, Glenda. Yes, one final one. I know of a few universities and graduate institutions that have woven the theme of sustainability into their entire teaching and research program. Mm -hmm. Plus in the financial planning, HR, and other types of management in their institutions. It is used as one of the mission themes of the institutions. Yep. Very good comment. Yep, and um, that's, that's where the UWI is pushing yes. hard to go. Go ahead. Yes. Now, the final one, I see goal 16, for instance, it speaks to democracy. It's a foundation goal, but often ignored by repressive governments. Yep. And I, what stood out for me when you were showing the diagram was goal six, clean mm -hmm. water and sanitation. And it, mm -hmm. it, wasn't, it hadn't even started yet. There was no green. Wow. And that, that jumped out at me. Hmm. Um, if you look at goals, look at how far, it's, yes, it's, it's yes. Far into yellow and then a whole set of red. No targets met. And, and this is water. Wow. Right. wow. So um, it, it, it makes us think that, Emily, we need to have a part two or part three, perhaps, of this global conversation. Yes. We just started this conversation. Perhaps Absolutely. we need to continue the conversation. And during your conversation with us, you've been saying, what can I do? Yes. What can you do? What can we as a collective do? Yes. And that is why this conversation is so important. And this is why we need to continue the conversation to see how we can contribute. Many of us may ask the question, but we may not, as you said, we have the solution in us, but we yes. may need some prompting yes. and, and you're our prompt. <laughs> Well, 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 myself and a whole team, including yourself, the, the, our campus is very good at, um, at a number of things, which would include helping people with entrepreneurial activities, setting up your NGO, how do you do all those kinds of business. And in fact, um, Dr. Slowly would so, should certainly take note that we need to actually be putting on those kinds of um, new training, although I suspect they already exist. So should I wrap up then, um, yes. Glenda? Any Thank other you. comments at all? No other comments. I think we can wrap up No, Thank you. Okay. I want to just say what um, the Secretary General of the UN said, and he was quite, he was both upset, sad, distraught, and so on. I, I followed the UN General Assembly recently, and he said we must rise higher to rescue the Sustainable Development Goals, and stay true to our promise of a world of peace, dignity, and prosperity on a healthy planet. Now, I start. I, when I started, I spoke about Zeldin 
talking about conversations and that conversation doesn't just reshuffle the cards, it creates new cards. And right here this evening from some of the comments, we have heard some new, new up, some opportunity for new things for persons. We need to go out there and set up our NGOs. If we cannot find an NGO that's doing it, we can do that. And it is my hope that some or all of what we have discussed this evening resonates with many of us and spurs us to action as individuals, as a part of the organization to which we are affiliated and as citizens contributing to efforts in our nation. Indeed, we have the opportunity to be a part of the global dialogue and action planning in the light of the push for a multi-level governance approach to how the UNFCC, for example, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the, the last course that I did that, that Glenda mentioned, which is um, multi-level governance, the focus now is not just on governments going to these conventions and the conference of the parties, but bringing in NGOs, bringing in civil society, bringing in individuals who will also take part, who will also make commitments because the, 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 the approach that was taken before has not worked after seven and a half years. And certainly we need to be doing better. So I wanna stop here and I wanna again, thank every, those who have joined us wherever you've joined from. And hopefully we have a good report, recording that we can share again and um, do reach out to us um, and do, do do your own research. Let's start setting up those NGOs because even if you help, you know, we had a song we sang in Trinidad. If I can, I'm not going to sing. If I can help somebody as I pass along, then my living shall not be in vain. So thank you very much. Thank you, Glenda. Thank you, organizers from the Global Campus. And thank you to all the viewers. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. So as Emily, as we would say, here endeth the lesson. <laughs> That's right. I was singing the song in my head, if I could help somebody, but I like you, I don't have the, 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 the tune. <laughs> so um, the, the moderator has given us the signal that he's not live streaming anymore. Excellent presentation, Emily, and exquisite uh, moderation, Glenda. This, I really feel proud of, of our presentation to the global conversations, really. We, we, we do it well at the global campus, I have to tell you. We are still live. <laughs> well, I, I meant to say that deliberately. <laughs> uh, there's nothing surreptitious or some anything I should hide about that. I'm very proud of it. Thank you, Glenda, for supporting the conversation because we didn't want it to be 